All right, so before the break, I told you that I would say something about uh, lower bounds, but I changed my mind and I prefer to keep going with upper bounds and algorithms to keep the flow going. Um, you can do it as an exercise to show that the 1 over square root is optimal, and if you cannot do it, you can come and ask me how to do it. Um, okay, so now I'm going to tell you a, a problem. Okay, so far I mostly told you algorithms and what you can do with it. I'm going to tell you a problem. And uh, we'll see how to use, or rather not how to use directly what we said, but a variant of it. Okay, so this is what's the number? Uh, five. A first non-Euclidean setting. And this is going to be about uh, prediction with expert advice. So it's in the same philosophy as this uh, online convex optimization that I just told you about before the break. So it goes like this. So at each time step, Uh, the player, the algorithm, slash algorithm, picks an action. Let's denote it by it in uh, 1 through n. Okay, so there are n possible actions and he picks one of them. And at the same time, simultaneously, an adversary picks a loss vector LT in 0, 1 to the n. Okay, so LT plays the role of my convex function before, okay, which is changing at every time step. So there are many ways to, to think about this problem. One of them is you can imagine that there are n experts who are trying to predict, say, whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not. And you know you can ch choose which expert you're going to follow, and then uh, for each expert, uh, you know either they were correct or they were incorrect. So they get either a loss of zero or they get a loss of one. Okay, and then you go on to the next time step. You select another expert. You see whether he or she was right, and and so on and so forth. And what you care about is again this regret notion, which is the sum for t equals one to capital T of uh, LT of IT minus, let's say, LT of I. Okay, so this is a regret with respect to action I, let's say. Okay, and you would like this to be bounded for every action. Yes? So why regret? Right, why regret? Um, so this is how much I regret for not having the foresight to play action i at every time step. You know, I look at, I'm at the end of the game, and I look at all actions. One of them was performing better than the other ones, and I regret for not having been playing that action at every time step. Yeah, but uh, we're going to, I'm going to say more about why regret. I mean, why this term? Uh, OK, so this is what, uh, what we want to control. So we can use directly gradient descent for this. OK, so approach one. Use gradient descent on the function ft. Let's uh, suggestively use the, not the variable p for the variable. The, the notation p, on ft, which is the inner product lt dot p, with the constraint set k being the simplex. OK, so all the vectors uh, p in r plus n, such that the sum of the pi is equal to uh, 1. OK, so what I'm, I'm saying here is that instead of selecting an action, I'm actually going to select a probability distribution. Okay? And, in, and when I'm you know, pushed to actually play an action, I'm just going to sample from this probability distribution. And the way I think about it is that I have a convex function. This convex function is just this linear function. 
Okay, you see, if I play action i, you know, deterministically, it's like playing the probability distribution, which is a, a Dirac point mass at location i. And then this is my loss LT of i. Okay, so I can run gradient descent on these functions. And I don't know if it's still here. Yeah, it's here. The only things that I need to control, there are two terms. There is the range term and there is the variance term. The range term is just about, you know, the size of the simplex. And the size of the simplex, when viewed with the Euclidean norm, is just one. It's some constant. It's one. But what about the variance term? What is the gradient? The gradient of Ft of p at p, this is just Lt, which is a vector with zeros and ones. So the Euclidean norm of this guy can be big, square root of n, square root of the dimension. And here, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that before, in those rates of convergence, the dimension did not appear. Okay, this is, I, I didn't uh, emphasize it enough, but it's one of the reasons why gradient descent is used in high dimensional uh, spaces is because the rate of convergence does not depend on the dimension. Okay, it doesn't matter the dimension. But of course, the point is a gradient, you know, has n bits of information in it. So there is no contradiction. But, uh, but now we see that in this setting, the dimension is going to appear because the L2 norm of the LT is square root n. Okay, so if we use directly what we did, what do we get? So with uh, so we get that our regret, okay, so the sum, let's say, the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of Lt dot Pt minus Lt dot uh, Q, okay, so I compare to some fixed point Q, so for any Q in the simplex, we get that this thing, okay, the sum of the in our previous notation, ft of x, t minus ft of x star. We get that this is bounded by what? Okay, we get the range, which is like 1 over 2 eta, plus eta over 2. And then we get this variance, which is, remember, the sum of the L2 norm of those things, L2 norm squared. Okay, the L2 norm squared can be n, so we get plus eta over 2 tn. Okay, which when you optimize is uh, square root tn. Okay, so square root t times uh, the dimension. Okay, so that's what, and, and, and again this, you know, if you play, note that if it is played at random from pt, then the expectation of the sum of the lt of it uh, this is equal to the expectation of the sum of the lt dot pt. Right, so this thing does control the regret that we cared about before. So I thought if you don't have the expectation on uh, So, it, yeah, what's random in, in the right hand side is that if the adversary picks LT at time step T, it could depend on the actions that I have taken before. But it's not really, it doesn't really matter. In fact, for all of what we're going to do, you can think that the sequence LT was chosen beforehand and is kind of fixed. OK, but now here is the key point of the entire course. Uh, so this n is, uh, where is, uh, this n is suboptimal. You don't need to pay the dimension. So this is suboptimal. In fact, you can replace n by log n, okay? so we, which is much, much, much better. And the reason is because what gradient descent did not get, did not understand, and did not use, is the fact that in this problem, we know that the optimum, we know that opt q, this guy, it has a very special structure. It's a very sparse vector. Okay, opt is just a point mass, it's just a one in one location. So opt is sparse. And what we will want to use is we want to 
use this prior information about opt to obtain a better algorithm. Okay, so gradient descent, so, so the optimal rate, which we're going to see, is square root t log n. And what I said is gradient descent does not use the fact that opt is sparse. Okay, and this notion of sparsity is not at all the key point of, of my course. This is just an example. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is much more general structure than this, which is why also it could be applied to many other problems. But in this special case, it's really the sparsity that we want to get at. So one way to view it is that we're going to change the algorithm so that it uses this information. And the way it's going to use this information is that basically it's simply going to move faster when it's far from sparse points. So we're going to have a variant of gradient descent that kind of, if it's in a region of space where it's far from a sparse point, then it just moves faster because it knows at the end of time it cannot be there. At the end of time, it should be at one of those sparse points. So it's, if it's currently in one of those regions which is non-sparse, then it should move a little bit faster. Uh, sorry, what do you mean by sparsity here? Uh, here I just mean that it's uh, opt is a vector which has only one entry which is non-zero. Okay, so what we'll do, we will uh, modify GD so that it moves faster when far from a sparse point. Of course, I need to, all of these things I need to make much more precise. Okay? So this is what mirror descent is going to be. Mirror descent is going to be about having a certain, uh, having a certain uh, metric on my space k, certain Riemannian structure on my space k. I'm going to explain all of this, and which will allow to change the speed of gradient descent. But before we do that, let me tell you the historical solution to this problem, okay? because it's a very beautiful algorithm. And in fact, it is mirror descent, but when you see it first, it's uh, yeah. just a nice algorithm. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a, a square root t log n algorithm for this prediction with expert advice. It's going to be very first principle. So I will just have a weight for each action, which I'm going to update as I see losses. So the way I'm going to do it, yes, please. Um, I have two questions. One, the, the, our set k is supposed to be convex, so it's supposed to be the whole simplex, or is it really just a uh, surface? Uh, yeah, so it's not, a, it's not a body. It's not a convex body, but it's a convex set. It's all the points that sum to 1 with non-negative entries. That's a convex set. Right, if I have to, yeah. And uh, another question. Um, uh, now we are always trying to go with the, with the descent method into the direction of this, this gradient. Right. But the gradient does not point to one of these sparse vectors, or does it? Uh, no, it does. I mean, if I were, you know, if I have this linear function and I want to minimize it, if I want to go as far as possible, eventually I'm going to go to a vertex of the simplex. So if I keep doing step in that direction with a projection on the simplex, then eventually I will get to a vertex. Just like, uh, you know, yes. if it's like this and I point like that, yeah. you know, maybe I move here, but then I project. Then I move here, but then I project. Yeah, wouldn't it then be just directly better to just use the directions that point into directions of, it, of corners? Yeah, so yes. Uh, I mean, I, I already see that I'm doing a wrong step there. Yeah, yeah, no, you're totally right. Um, so if you really cared about 
optimization, what you say, makes more sense. And, and this has a name, which is called conditional gradient descent or Frank Wolf algorithm. So this makes a lot of sense. But uh, in the present situation, it doesn't because, because of stability. So I, I will explain why you want a more stable algorithm. This is going to be one of the key points also. Uh, but what you suggest is not stable enough. This was an open problem at some point to show that what you say, I mean, some people were suggesting what you say, but in fact, you can prove that it doesn't work. It's not stable enough. Yeah. But it works for convex optimization, just static convex optimization. Here's the function. Remember, the functions are changing over time. Right. Any other question? So I'm not, I'm not going to give you the gradient descent solution right now. I'm going to give you a super simple algorithm, which is called multiplicative weight updates. And we'll see it's very beautiful. But then we're going to see that, in fact, it's just an instance of mirror descent. OK, so the multiplicative weight update algorithm, MWU. So this is after uh, Littlestone and Warmus. in uh, 89 and it goes like this so uh, fix w1 which is just the all one vector so that's the weight with which you start now at time t do the following for any i such that lti is equal to 1 so any action which incurred a loss, I'm just going to reduce the weight of that action by some multiplicative fraction. Okay, I'm just going to reduce it a little bit. So for any i such that LT of i is 1, Wt plus 1 of i is going to be 1 minus eta times Wt of i. Okay, I just reduce it a little bit. I mean, this guy didn't perform very well that round. And just say, OK, I, he should have a smaller weight going further. And otherwise, just keep it. Otherwise, uh, Wt plus 1 of i is Wt of i. OK, and the probability distribution that I play from is just a normalized weight. OK, play from Pt which is Wt normalized by the L1 norm of Wt. OK, so is the algorithm clear? That's well defined. So what we're going to see eventually is that this is gradient descent in the Riemannian geometry induced by the entropy. OK, but here you don't see that at all, I think. But, uh, but we're going to see that. OK, so let's, let's do uh, uh, an analysis of this. So here is a theorem. So the theorem goes like this. Uh, for any q, maybe let me see. Yeah, uh, we have the following. So maybe let me define. Let me just introduce some notation. L capital T. This is going to be the sum for t equals one to capital T of p t dot l t or l t dot p t. And L star. This is going to be uh, the minimum over all q in the simplex of the sum for t equals 1 to capital T of lt dot q. OK, so this is the best you could have obtained in hindsight. This is what you want to compare to. And this is what you actually suffered in expectation. OK, notice that here there is nothing random. Everything is deterministic right now. OK, so this is going to be a completely deterministic reason. And what I'm going to show to you is that lt is smaller than 1 plus eta times L star uh, plus log n over eta. Okay, which implies if you can optimally tune eta, this implies LT is smaller than square root uh, L star log n, maybe with a factor 2. And which implies this is more than 2 square root t log n. OK, 
Okay, so my, my regret is bounded by this t log n, okay, which again is a huge improvement over basic gradient descent. Basic gradient descent would get squared t times n. n is the dimension. Here you get t log n. Yes? Yes, thank you. Yes. Lt minus L star. Yeah. This is your, your regret is bounded by this. And the point, the reason why I point out this one out is that it's uh, foreshadowing one of the other miracles of, of mirror descent, which is adaptivity. So that will be the last thing we're, we're going to talk about. And here the adaptivity is to the fact that if I have a sequence where opt doesn't pay much, then my regret is in fact much better than the worst case. So it kind of adapts to the easiness of the data. But I'm going to talk much more about that later. So just to give you a, uh, yeah, I, I will point to this later on. So, okay, so I'm going to prove this inequality. Yes. Uh, here, PT is the distribution, but the true loss is based on what you have played. It's like a zero one. Yes. Good. Uh, yeah. Yes. But uh, in expectation is the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you the proof of this result, and it's, uh, to me, a, a magical proof. I mean, it's super simple, but it's very hard to see. I mean, it's not so easy to come up with that proof, whereas once you cast it in the mirror descent framework, it's going to be very easy to come up with that proof. But let, let's do the historical proof. So again, just like in the analysis of gradient descent, I'm going to look at some potential. I'm going to track some potential, and here the potential is uh, the normalization constant. Okay, so track the L1 norm of WT. This is our potential. Let's see how this thing evolves. So what I want to say is let's see how the L1 norm at time t plus 1 compares to the L1 norm at times t. So what is this? Okay, so you know, the L1 norm at times uh, t plus 1, I just have reduced by a factor eta all the guys who made a mistake. Okay, so this is just the L1 norm of Wt minus eta times the sum over all the i such that Lti is equal to 1 of Wti. Right, so I have just reduced by a factor eta everybody who made the mistake. But you know, eventually I want to have something that depends on the on the loss of my algorithm, which is this inner product lt dot pt. So let me rewrite this as lt dot pt. Okay, this is really lt dot wt, right? Because for the zero, the zeros are not included, and the ones are included with a weight of one. Right, so this is just lt. Uh, dot wt. So now I can factor out the L1 norm of wt and I get just Lt dot pt. Okay, so this is equal to the L1 norm of wt times 1 minus eta Lt dot pt. Okay, and now I'm just going to use that 1 minus x is smaller than e to the minus x, okay, or log 1 plus x is smaller than x. Uh, so 1 minus eta lt dot pt, this is smaller than e to the minus eta lt. Okay, so this is smaller than the L1 norm times e to the minus eta uh, lt dot pt. Okay, so by induction, I, I will just get the product of those things. So, and at time 1, the L1 norm of Wt is n. So I get that this is smaller than n times e to the minus eta capital Lt. Right, so I know that, uh, let's say, at time, OK, maybe uh, Lt, like this. OK, so I know that the L1 norm at the final time step is smaller than n times e to the minus my total loss.
Okay, so that's an upper bound. And now I'm going to lower bound it by the value of opt, which is very simple because uh, this thing is certainly larger than uh, wt plus 1 of i for any action i. And what is wt plus 1 of i? Well, it's just 1 minus eta to the number of times that it did a mistake. So this is just equal to 1 minus eta times, let's say, uh, L star for uh, t equals capital T and i equals i star. OK, so if I look at this inequality at, at opt, at the final time, I get 1 minus eta to the L star. OK, so now I'm done. Um, but first, is there a question on these inequalities? So again, I, I just track the normalization constant. Clearly, the normalization constant is, is bigger than the term for opt, which is just 1 minus eta to the number of times that it did a mistake. And a very simple identity shows that also it's smaller than the starting point times e to the minus eta times the loss of the algorithm. Okay, so the inequality again that I get is uh, what is it? 1 minus eta to the L star smaller than n times e to the minus eta LT. So if I just take logs everywhere, I get L star uh, log 1 minus eta smaller than log n minus eta LT. So LT is smaller than log n over eta plus log 1 minus eta uh, minus, okay, plus with a minus <coughs> over eta L star. And you know, if you just expand log 1 minus eta with a minus, you have a term eta and you have a term eta squared normalized by eta, so that gives you a 1 and an eta which is these things. OK, and in fact, you can even improve a little bit the constant. OK, so that, that's, uh, again, a huge, a really big saving, this log n instead of the n. And now we're going to see in a more principled way how to get that. Any question on this? Yeah? Can you get dimension free, um, like a lower bound that is dimension free? No, so, so log n is optimal. Okay. Uh, this just comes from the fact that if you take the max of n Gaussians, then the maximum is of order square root log n. So it's an exercise also. In fact, here you can prove the optimality of everything, the constant and, and everything. OK. So, so we move to the second chapter. Uh, mirror descent. So I will finally define the algorithm. And it's a second miracle. Okay, the first miracle is uh, this robustness that we already talked about. OK, so what I'm going to do is that I'm, I'm just going to realize this idea of changing the structure so that I can make gradient descent move faster in certain region of space. And the way I'm going to encode that is that I'm going to endo, endo k with a Riemannian structure. And I always get the ends wrong, so there are some double ends somewhere uh, with a Riemannian structure. 
So what do I mean by that? I just mean that I have an inner product for any x in k. OK, so at any point, my tangent space is going to be all of Rn. And I get a, a, an inner product that depends on the location x. So the gradient now, so before I had grad f of x, Okay, what is the definition of grad f of x? It's a, it's the, you know, it's a linear function, which gives me the approximation in the first order term of the Taylor expansion. So what I want to say is that f of x plus dx, this is roughly like f of x plus grad f of x uh, in a product with dx. But this inner product is a Euclidean inner product. Now I have a Riemannian in our product. So what I'm going to do is that the gradient in my manifold M of f at x, this is going to be defined by f of x plus dx should be roughly like f of x plus the inner product at x of the gradient of M, f of x uh, with dx. OK, so this is pretty general. But I'm going to instantiate this for Hessian manifold. OK, so these inner products are going to be given by the Hessian of a certain convex function. Yes? Yeah, please. f of x with dx, you mean that you would have an additive way in the manifold? Yes. Would there be other ways to move to make small displacements around x? Yes. Yes, there would be other ways. Um, so let me just think how to answer this question. Um, so eventually, um, so it, let me just think how to explain. So you will see. So what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to define a certain equivalent of a gradient flow on my manifold. But then when you will want to discretize it, there will be different ways to discretize it. Because you know, it's either you move out and then you project, or you try to follow the exponential map. So at that point, there will be different ways to do the small perturbation. But in terms of the gradient flow, there will be only a single way. OK, okay. so we will consider m such that the inner product at the point x is nothing but the Hessian of a certain function phi dot dot. OK, so this is a, a Hessian manifold. OK, so the quadratic form associated with this inner product is given, there is some uh, notion of, I don't know if rigidity is the right term, but smoothness of this manifold, which is that it's given by the action of a fixed convex function. OK, and this is going to encode the geometry. So all the geometry is encoded by this convex function. This is where the, the prior information is going to go in. OK, so I will have some prior information about opt here. And this prior information is going to dictate what kind of geometry I will use to define my mirror descent. So if you have a, a manifold like this, then the gradient has a very simple expression, which is just the inverse Hessian applied to it. OK, so now, now the gradient in M of f of x, this is nothing but the Hessian of phi at x inverse applied to the Euclidean gradient of f of x. Okay, this is just by by this de per this definition. Okay, so there are many many ways to come up with this, with saying that you want to move in this direction. You can view this as some kind of preconditioning. So if you're familiar with optimization, you know it might be that your variables, you know, maybe moving in the first 
the first coordinate, you know, a little movement makes big change in the function, but in the second coordinate, you need to make huge moves to make a change in the value of the function. So then you want to condition differently how you move in the first coordinate and in the second coordinate. So this type of uh, preconditioning will do that for you. And here it's a preconditioning that depends on the point at which we are currently. Another way to see it is that, again, it's this thing where you might move faster in certain regions of space. You know? Basically, where uh, the function phi, the, the curvature is the smallest, you're going to move very fast. And where the curvature is very high, you're going to slow down a lot. Okay, so if I have a, a convex set like this, and let's say, for instance, I have a function which blows up towards the boundary, then the curvature towards the boundary is going to infinity, so the, the, this thing is going to slow down a lot when you get close to the boundary. And when you're inside, you're going to move faster. So it's going to do exactly what we wanted to do for this uh, multiplicative weights update. It's going to move faster when you're far away from sparse points. Okay. So mirror descent, so, um, so idea is to do xt plus 1, which is going to be something like uh, xt minus, so right now I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting about uh, k and any, any kind of uh, uh, boundary. Let's say it's just something very simple like this, minus the Hn phi, so some learning rate eta, Hn phi at xt inverse applied to uh, gt, and gt is some gradient. Okay, so this is now the type of equation that I want to look at. Instead of simply moving, uh, instead of having those gradients, I kind of precondition them with this function. Okay. So if gt was coming from the gradient of some fixed function, then you can, you can say that you're doing Riemannian gradient descent instead of simple gradient descent. Um, I mean, not, not quite, but OK. All right, so the problem is, how do, do you analyze this? Okay, so the question is, what is the potential? Okay, is there a potential? How, how do you analyze this type of uh, thing? Okay, and this is where there is really a miracle, which is that these equations, they come with a potential, which is the Bregman divergence associated to phi. Okay, so miracle, d phi is a potential. And in fact, uh, so this was introduced, this was observed by ne Nemirovsky. Um, in 79, so 10 years before uh, Littlestone and uh, Warmus, which is 89. And Nemirovsky defined mirror descent, so he didn't have the Riemannian interpretation, but he defined it like this because when you define it like this, you get a potential. So for him, like, he started from the potential and then derived the algorithm. Um. Okay, so let's, let's do this calculation of the potential. Do you remind what new phi was? Yeah, phi is an arbitrary convex function. So phi is a fixed uh, convex function. So phi, uh, the algorithm depends on phi. What, what, what? Say again? Oh, d phi, d phi. Uh, it's a Bregman divergence. I'm going to write it down again. I'm going to write it down again. It's the, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write it down. OK, so first, I'm going to write an algorithm, a full algorithm with constraints. So continuous time mirror descent. So 
So I'm going to write something and then I'm going to explain where it comes from. So we're going to look at the following flow. The time, so G uh, from R plus to Rn is a smooth uh, uh, to Rn is a smooth uh, vector field. Okay, so now in continuous time, I will have those gradients. Okay, they come from something. And what I'm going to look at is d over dt of x of t. This is going to be defined as follows. This is going to be minus uh, the Hessian phi at x t inverse applied to eta step size times this gradient, gt, plus lambda t, where lambda t is a dual, is a Lagrange multiplier, so it's an element of the normal cone at x of t. Okay, so this is a definition. This is my definition of x of t. Okay, so I move continuously with this type of preconditioning, and I have this uh, Lagrange multiplier. So where does this come from? So this comes from the following. This is the same thing as saying that um, xt plus dt, this is the argmin of the following quantity. Uh, let me just see. I want to explain it like that. Uh, yeah. So you remember gradient descent? Xt plus 1 equals Xt minus eta Gt. Right? Another way to view this is that this is the argmin of the linear function eta Gt plus uh, a proximal term, one half of the Euclidean norm of xt minus x. OK, so this is the gradient descent step that I wrote, you know, very first thing in the first hour. And what I'm saying is that another way to see it is that you want to minimize this linear function, but you also don't want to get too far from the previous term. OK, if you just... Uh, uh, look at the optimality condition of this thing, these two things are the same. And if I, if I had a projection here, it would be the same thing as having a constraint here. Okay? So now this equation, where does it come from? It comes from just minimizing eta gt uh, dot x plus one half of the norm of x minus xt but the norm at xt squared. And this is over x in k. Right? And this norm, this local norm, is just the one which is given by the local inner product. Okay? So the local norm of h at x squared, this is just the Hessian phi at x applied to hh. Right, so if you, it's an exercise that you know. You, if you just apply the first order optimality condition to this problem, you will find this algorithm. Okay, so it's just that my proximal term, it's it's exactly a gradient descent, except that my proximal term is given by the distance on the manifold, or some approximation to it, because he, this is just x t. OK, um, so this is not your usual type of, uh, uh, of PDE because I'm not telling you exactly what the derivative is. I'm telling you the derivative is in some set. OK, so this is called the differential inclusion. And it's not completely obvious that this has a solution uh, or that it's unique because, you know, I can choose many derivatives. But uh, the point is here is a theorem. So xt exists and is unique. 
okay, up to some very minor uh, smoothness assumption on phi and g, which I'm not going to specify. But basically, this is a fully specified algorithm. In what sense is this unique? Uh, what do you mean? Oh, you mean, sure, you can change it like, uh, sure. On, you, you're saying that on a set of measure zero, you can change it. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that is true. Uh, so basically up to that. Yeah. Which is a bit surprising because you could imagine that you have many ways to move. But basically either, you know, either you're staying put at one of those points where there is a big cone. And then, you know, it doesn't matter which one you use, you're just staying put. Or if you move, then as soon as you move, you know, the cone condition does not apply anymore. What? In the norm, the solid state x of t, which one is going to be what Say again? Uh, what does it mean exactly? Uh, it means this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uniqueness is if you constrain the trajectory to stay within k? Uh, very good. Yes, I do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, thanks. It's this and x of t is in k. Yeah. Thanks, Laurent. Okay, so now here is the magic. Uh, the magic is the analysis of this algorithm. Okay. So analysis. We are going to look at uh, the following quantities. The potential is going to be d phi of y. Y is some fixed point, a target point, to xt. Okay, so this thing, you can, uh, again, the, the formula is phi of y minus phi of xt minus grad phi of xt in our product with uh, y minus xt. This is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the evolution of this potential. So let's take the time derivative of this thing, d over dt of d phi. What is this? OK, this doesn't change as a function of time, so this is 0. Here, what do we get? We get minus grad phi of xt in our product with uh, d over dt of xt. OK, that's this term. Now, what do we get for this one? OK, we, we just have two terms, one where we differentiate this one and one where we differentiate that one. Let's first differentiate this one. So we get minus the Hessian of phi at xt applied to d over dt xt. And this is inner product with y minus xt. And now we have the last term, which is when we differentiate this. So minus grad phi of xt inner product with the time derivative of this, which is minus d over dt of x of t. Now, that term cancels with this one. We're left with only this term. But the mirror descent flow is defined by what is the Hessian of phi of xt applied to d over dt of xt. So this, I know that it's exactly the following with the minus sign. Um, this is equal to what? To uh, eta gt plus lambda t in a product with y minus xt. OK, and, and so far it's all equalities. These are all equalities. Again, this was defined because I mirror descent flow is defined so that minus h and phi times the derivative of x is equal to something. 
But now I'm just going to use that this is in the normal cone. It's in the normal cone, so it's negatively correlated with any direction going inside. This is a direction going inside. So I have that this is smaller than eta gt in a product with y minus xt. OK, and, and this is like everything that happens with mirror descent is here now, because you can think of it as, again, this is the linear function. This is your gradient. You can think that gt dot y is what, the, what opt is paying right now. If this was the gradient, this is how suboptimal is y right now. And what you're paying is gt dot xt. So if you regret not being at y, if gt dot xt is bigger than y, then this is negative, meaning that your Bregman divergence is going down. So if you regret, if you're, if you're paying more than opt is paying, then you're also learning. Your Bregman divergence is, go, is, is shrinking, is getting smaller. OK? So again, this algorithm has the property that whenever it makes a mistake, it fixes itself, basically. It learns about why. So let me write just the integral version sorry, of this. So the integral version is going to be like that. So what do we get? We get that uh, so the integral from time 0 to time capital T of g of t dot uh, x of t minus y dt, which you can think of as your regret. right? This is your regret term. This is upper bounded by uh, d phi of y to x at time 0 over eta. And you see, compared to the previous bounds that I have written for you, previously we had two terms. We had the range term and the variance term. And here there is only a, a range term. There is no variance term because, as I explained to you before, when you move to continuous time, the variance term disappears because it's like taking the step size to zero. So we have only a range term. Okay. So next, what I will need to show to you is how to use this very nice, beautiful uh, continuous time proof to get a discrete time proof. Okay. So we we are going to do that next, but maybe I just write for you the, the theorem. <clears throat> But first, is there, is there a question on, on the meaning of this? Yeah. The last inequality the, say again? The last inequality, the last one. Yeah. Uh, we know that uh, lambda t is in the normal corner at x sub t. But yeah. uh, there we have also y minus x sub t. Yes. So the definition of the normal cone is that your inner product with any direction inside the body is negative. So y minus xt, that's a direction inside the body. So the inner product with lambda t is negative. What? Because lambda t is in the normal corner at x of t. Yes. But how about y? Because yeah, that term is minus, but how about y? So, so I have x of t here, and I have some y here. And all I'm saying is y minus x of t. Yes, y is it? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, yes, yes. This is, this is true. Yeah, this is for any y in k. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So by itself, uh, this theorem is pretty meaningless. 
because you know, for instance, it's telling you that at some, if this was the gradient of some convex function, it's telling you that at some point in time, you visit a value which is smaller than this divided by t. But you can always speed up time by just making phi, uh, if you make phi smaller, then the Hessian inverse gets bigger, and you know, the, the, like you, you just accelerate. These things get smaller and smaller. So by itself, this theorem is meaningless, and you need some kind of stability on top of it. Okay? So this is where also the stability that I mentioned for Frank Wolf and conditional gradient descent. Uh, so it's non-trivial to show stability, but, but we're going to do that. Okay, so the discrete time theorem. And I'm, I'm going to conclude with that for today. Um, so the point is, yeah, the point is for what we will want to do, mainly we're going to use this continuous time version as an inspiration for the discrete time. It's going to remove the magic of the discrete time. Yes? You change the metrics, so would it be possible actually to get a result with the geodesic distance instead of the divergency? Yes. Uh, yeah, good. Um, so it's going to make a big difference in discrete time. So I think in continuous time, it doesn't make a, a big difference. So I'm not sure, but I, I think it doesn't make a big difference. But this is really the right term in continuous, in discrete time. Um, yeah, and, and you know what? Maybe I, I keep discrete time uh, for tomorrow. There is no, no point in rushing it. Uh, the only thing I want to say is maybe just, just look at this discrete time version. So, um, let me just think how I want to explain. Yeah, let's say you want to discretize, so discretize uh, the following thing. Um, d over dt of x of t is minus the Hessian phi at xt gt. Let's say we don't have the constraint. Okay, so this is the same thing as <coughs> the Hessian phi at xt uh, xt is equal to minus gt. So if I integrate this gives me that, let's say, grad phi. So you know, if I integrate this, uh, there should be a d over dt, I get grad phi of xt, right? This is d over dt of grad phi of xt. OK? So I miss an inverse in the first equation. And here there is no inverse. Yes, good. So you see the discrete time version is going to be that I update the gradient of phi. OK, so the discrete time, discrete time is going to be grad phi of xt plus 1 is equal to grad phi of xt minus, let's say, eta gt. OK, so instead, gradient descent was just xt plus 1 is xt minus eta gt. And our mirror descent is grad phi of xt plus 1 is grad phi of xt minus eta gt. So you can think of it as instead of doing an update in the primal, you're doing an update of in the dual. You can think that before gradient descent didn't make so much sense because xt is a primal point and gt was a dual point. It was a linear function. So you're adding primal and dual points, which does, does make sense in finite dimension because those things are isomorphic. But if you were in infinite dimension, it wouldn't make sense. And what mirror descent is doing is that it's fixing this issue. It's first mapping the point to a dual point by using the gradient of some ambient function, then doing the update in the dual, and then mapping back to a primal point. Okay. So this, this equation is without constraint, and tomorrow I will write the equation with constraint and do the analysis, which was the same thing as the gradient descent analysis, using the continuous time version as a, as a guiding principle. Okay, and then we're going to see applications of it. Okay, is there is there any question? And and we'll see that multiplicative weights is just a version of this. That's also what we're going to see. Yeah.
So in the discrete time regime, so there is no lambda or it's a special case? No, there, there, the way we're going to handle the lambda is going to be uh, non-trivial. So I will explain. Yeah. Yes, you can. Uh, and there is a lot to be said about that. <laughs> Uh, yes, you can, you can, if you have what's called the barrier function for the set K, then you don't need to do any projection. This is fully well defined. Uh, and you can do that, but sometimes it's not the most appropriate things to do. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Okay, so is there another question? Maybe we can uh, thank Sebastian.